how to be an executive director. I mean, we could talk about this forever, but today we're being really specific for a really good reason. We're going to be talking about specifically about using engagement organizations to strengthen, to have impact for your organization. And we've got a wonderful panel for you. Lots of great uh, guests for you today. So we're, we know you're going to get lots out of this session. And we want, of course, you to join for lots of sessions coming up. Uh, Rob's going to be able to share a little bit about that. Rob Barnes, of course, from the Capacity Building Institute, be able to share a little bit more about that uh, with you as well. I wanted to take this time and, uh, and introduce some of our uh, panelists and uh, get to know them a little bit. I'd like to uh, welcome to the show Montana Burgess. Hi, Montana. Hello. Montana, tell us a little bit about you. Uh, my name is Montana Burgess. I use she, her, or they, them pronouns. Um, I'm the executive director at Neighbors United. We just updated our name from West Kootenai Eco Society. So I'm based in southeastern British Columbia on the traditional unceded territory of the Sinaiks peoples who are not extinct, despite what the federal government says. And I'm really happy to be joining you today. Oh, thank you so much. I'm really glad you're here. Graham Saul is joining us as well. Hi, Graham. Hello. Hi, Graham. Tell us a little bit about you and what you're gonna to bring to us today. So my name is Graham Saul. I'm the executive director of Nature Canada, which is a national nature conservation charity working with others to discover, defend and restore nature. I've been working on social and environmental justice issues for about uh, 25 years, including about 15 years as executive directors of internationally focused organizations like Climate Action Network, uh, nature groups like Nature Canada and local grassroots organizing work like uh, Ecology Ottawa. Excellent. Thank you so much. And to round out our panel today, I'm really uh, thrilled to welcome uh, Stan Kozak. Hi, Stan. Ah, there we are. There Hi. Are. Well, nice Thank to join you. you. Uh, joining you uh, just across the water there is uh, Wikwemagam, unceded uh, Anishinaabe territory. And uh, so here on Manitoulin Island, Guelph is home for the rest of the time. And I am a relatively recently retired executive director with the Gosling Foundation, but still an active member of the board. And about seven or eight years ago, uh, with the help of some of the folks here today, we started a project called Better Organizations for Nature. And it was all based on bringing engagement, organizing tools, practices, and a worldview uh, to the environment and nature sector. So. Great to be part of this and continue in that work. Fascinating. A great trifecta of guests coming up. Uh, before we go any farther, I want to welcome Rob Barnes uh, from the Capacity Building Institute to share a little bit of time with us. Then we're going to get into our panel. We're going to have some Q&A and we encourage you to as well uh, let us know if you have questions as we walk through our time together today. As always, the chat's available for you. We'd love to know where you're coming from. We'd love to see where everyone comes from uh, across the country as well. So feel free to, to chat us up there and uh, over to you, Mr. Barnes. Thanks so much, Sam. And uh, thanks to all the panelists for being here. I'm really excited about uh, tonight's uh, or this, this evening's show. As well, thank you to all of you from joining uh, from all across the country. Really excited to have you. Uh, my name is uh, Rob Barnes. I'm the Executive Director of Capacity Building Institute. And I'm just going to take a few moments to, to walk you through what we do at Capacity Building Institute. So if you'll bear with me, I'll do the old uh, screen share here. So uh, this, uh, this webinar is part of our uh, capacity series of webinars, all about basically two overarching themes, how to be an Executive Director and how to be a board member. Now, this, of course, uh, this this webinar is part of our how to be an executive director kind of sub theme, but it's really you know for folks uh, uh, at every stage in their organization's uh, life and history. Some of us are starting new organizations. Some of us are trying to run organizations, often on the smaller side. Uh, some of us are part of larger organizations and and working to incorporate different methodologies and different practices in our work and. Uh, I think everyone on the panel will agree that engagement organizing is a very powerful tool and, and worth your time. Uh, so thanks for joining us. Um, what does Capacity Building Institute do? Well, we provide capacity building training and support to small environmental nonprofits. And in so doing, we really aim to bolster Canada's environmental sector. And really, we offer a range of uh, uh, programs uh, aimed at uh, leaders at every stage of their journey in the nonprofit sector. And we want to train 10,000 environmental leaders by 2030. Why do we do it? Well, 
there are some big challenges that all of us are facing, climate change, nature loss, species decline. And still, if you look at the numbers, the environmental sector still is, is a relatively small portion in terms of charitable contributions. So we think we can grow. We think there's a lot of uh, strength and capacity and, and there's no time like the present, no, no sense of urgency like now, uh, given of course the, the daily headlines and, and everything else. So, so there's a lot of work to do and uh, we wanna make Canada's environmental sector equal to its, its vital task. Uh, we think nonprofits play a vital role. We think the training matters. We think the environment deserves all the help it can get. And we think that there's much more to do. Uh, so, so we hope that these, uh, these monthly series will, will help you, help equip you with skills and, and knowledge to move forward. So as I said, this is part of our capacity series, but it's one of several offerings that we have. Um, we have a number of training programs and I'd say our flagship uh, program is called the Capacity Building Certificate Program. Uh, at the end of this uh, little blurb, you'll see a contact email. If you're interested in, in, in deep training on fundraising or on leadership uh, or any other aspect uh, of your organization, please get in touch and we'd be happy to help. We have a bunch of lead trainers, including the amazing Sam LaPrade, who's the host today. So uh, we hope that uh, we hope to bring a, a variety of skills and knowledge to, to share with, with folks at every stage of their journey. And uh, to date, we've helped a number of organizations, uh, including, you know, great folks like, uh, like David at Algonquin to Adirondacks, um, as well as a whole bunch, over 100 uh, interns starting their journey in the environmental nonprofit sector. And here's a, a testimonial from Hannah Beckstead uh, at Sea Change Canada talking about uh, the work of uh, Capacity Building Institute. Um, so as I said, we've got these webinars, they're free, they're monthly, check it out. And we just want to shout out to our managers, our mentors, we've got a whole team behind us. Uh, and thanks to Hannah for, for helping with operations here tonight. Thanks to our board members. And uh, as Sam mentioned, there are other dates. Uh, we hope you'll join us on Monday, September 12th for our next install installation in the uh, Capacity Series webinars. And, and the next one will be all about how to be a board member. And we're looking at board roles like the role of the treasurer. So we hope you'll join us. But without any further ado, I'd like to uh, open the floor back up to our host and uh, amazing panelists. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Rob. Appreciate uh, that great uh, overview. And I am loving this. We are literally coast to coast to coast, um, seeing all sorts of people uh, indicate where they're coming from. We even have somebody here from North Africa, which is amazing. Uh, it's great to see everybody here. Let's get into this topic today. You know, we've talked about uh, various aspects of how to be a, an executive director. Using engagement organizing uh, for, for that impact is such an important piece. Let's just set the stage right off. And, uh, you know, and Graham, tell us what what this is for people that maybe have never heard that term before. So my first job as an executive director was with Climate Action Network Canada, where we were focused primarily on national uh, climate change and international climate change policy during primarily the Harper years from 2007 to 2012. And I had the pleasure of working with Montana while I was there. Um, one of the things I realized during the transition from the, um, the, the Cretchen Martin years to the Harper years was that when there was a government in place that was at least willing to have a conversation about a given issue like climate change, a lot of the attention within the NGO community became focused on the skill sets associated with policy and research and lobbying. And it was very much all of our energy and capacity was geared towards essentially a polite behind the scenes conversation primarily with the government about many of the technical details associated with, um, with an issue. But then when a government came in that was uh, much more hostile or less willing to engage the NGO community, um, we didn't really have any recourse. We didn't have the ability to demonstrate that we had a constituency be behind us that really demanded action on the issue. And so for me, engagement organizing is just one of many tools. It's not to say that it is something everyone should be doing, but it's something that if we as a movement don't have the ability to engage our supporters, if we don't have the ability to grow our supporter base, to develop tools and strategies for engaging those people in increasingly meaningful ways and to mobilize them effectively over time, 
then we can't do something that has absolutely essential to the role of the NGO community within any social movement, which is demonstrate demand for action from decision makers who care about where the population is at. Mm -hmm. And so engagement organizing at its heart is really a combination of you know, traditional organizing methods that have been used by movements since the abolitionist movement um, that involve the kinds of protests and outreach and engagement with individuals and combined with the new digital tools that are now available to allow us to track uh, a, a growing supporter base and to engage that supporter base in much new and more creative ways using digital tools. But it, at its heart, it is about asking the question, how do you have a meaningful relationship with 50,000 people yeah. and grow your supporter base and mobilize them over time in increasingly meaningful ways? Okay, I heard a really, I mean, I heard lots of great stuff there, Graham, and I really appreciate that overview. Montana, the word used relationships, when we think about an executive director, that, that is all about the relationships that you have to have. But, you know, if you have 100 supporters, maybe in a small organization, or 50,000, like Graham referenced, that relationship building is an important piece. Can you talk a little bit about that relationship side of this? Yeah, I'd say that um, how I use engagement organizing is I use it every day, even within the, the way I work with my staff. So it's, it's a tactic and, and a way or strategy and a way of working, but it can also be applied in kind of every situation in your organization, if, if that's something that's uh, interesting to you. So for me, engagement organizing really spoke to me because it put a specific kind of practice together for things that I was naturally attracted to with my personality and, and the things I care about, the values I care about, like relationships and people. So for example, on a very small scale, um, when I started at the organization um, back seven years ago, when I came on as executive director, um, I started building my team using engagement organizing. And these were a combination of paid staff and also volunteers. And so I prioritized um, our relationships and our values and the strategy of the work we were doing over the tasks. And to me, that's the defining feature of engagement organizing. The work gets done because you have a strong mutual respect, shared values, and a clear mutual purpose. And the kind of key with engagement organizing is you're building leadership. So be it in your staff team, be it with 50,000 supporters, be it with, you know, a hundred people in a community, you're really trying to build leadership and organize yourself out of your role. That's kind of the mantra of engagement organizing. If you can get yourself out of your role and get someone else to take on those responsibilities and those relationships that you're checking in on, supervising with the mutual accountability, then you can grow to become a movement like Graham referenced. Mm -hmm. Beautifully said, Montana. And, you know, when I think about being an executive director, we hear the term a lot, you know, using time, talent, and treasure, right? Trying to engage people with time, with their talents, and with their treasure being financial resources. How does that fit into engagement organizing, in your opinion, Stan? Um, all of those things come from people. Okay, so, so with organizations, we're trying to find people who share our interests and then uh, work with them, learn with them so that they uh, build their, they bring their time, their talents and their treasures to the cause. And as Montana said, they, they their talents, particularly if that element of it, if we can raise that to a point where they are running with it and we give them um, lots of support and uh, scope, then we step back and watch the thing go. Um, so, so it's really that, that, uh, that scaling up comes from not control, but from releasing, um, capacity, developing and releasing that capacity. And that's when 
magical things start happening because it's it's there's more there than what you thought as an individual uh, people are bringing everything to it and you know we're not individually we're not as creative as the collective is and so we we get these things happening so so true so true and you know I, i'm thinking back to executive directors that i've worked with over the years and you know some of them if i can be so kind is to say bit micromanagers you know they're they're yeah. trying to hold everything really close and when i hear you know what graham and montana and stan has just said you know a lot of this is about actually you know releasing that energy out into the community and letting that that come back to you would you agree graham that this is uh you know basically a situation where you do have to really trust in the people around you as well yeah, I mean, I think if you're a, if you're an organization that has a supporter base, um, and uh, especially a grassroots organization, then at the end of the day, people are your greatest asset. Um, and I think Montana put it well when she talked about leadership, right? What you're essentially doing one of the one of the concepts that we often uh, use when we talk about engagement organizing is a ladder of engagement or a period of a pyramid of engagement where you're kind of trying to better understand the level of activity that each one of your supporters is interested in engaging with you around. How active, how much leadership are they prepared to show? And you're developing strategies to coach and move your supporters into increasingly meaningful roles within the organization. And of course, like, you can imagine the, the, the lowest rung is kind of they receive an email or there's a little bit of collectivism. But then at some stage, what you want to do is figure out how to get them off the couch. How do you get them out to events? And then you want to see if you can get them to volunteer. And then at some stage, you need to start developing leadership structures to have volunteers managing other volunteers. And the more you think about how to get the most out of people, the more you essentially have to acknowledge that it involves allowing them to show leadership rather than being constantly in control of anything. And that can be a little bit scary for many organizations, for many leaders, because they feel like they're letting go. But they are your greatest assets. The people, the people who care about your mission are your greatest assets. They are your greatest supporters. And as Stan said, you need to find a way to unlock the capacity the, the, what they can bring to your organization. If in fact, engaging people um, as opposed to strictly lobbying or research is a core dimension of your organization's mission. Mm -hmm. Beautifully said. I keep hearing in the back of my mind, the word culture. What culture does it take for this to be successful, Montana? Because I can imagine, you know, today we, we probably can't take an organization that isn't doing this kind of strategy and tactic and turn it into that organization tomorrow. I'm assuming there has to be a culture built in. Yeah, and it takes time to develop a culture and it takes discipline to develop a culture if you're trying to change a culture that maybe people are default used to. So maybe in the chat, you folks could put in there if you've been to a community meeting and it, you know someone stood up at, at some point and just gone off on a tangent about something random. Throw it in the chat if you have, tell us your story. Um, when I've been to many community meetings, I've seen that happen and I felt frustrated because uh, the meetings tended to go sideways kind of quickly. So one of the tools of engagement organizing that builds a, a, a really nice culture that I love is, is a practice of um, sharing a little bit about yourself at the beginning. And so if it's a big meeting, you're not gonna have a hundred people each stand up and share who they are and why they're there, but you can have them in smaller groups do that. And so we do that even in each of our staff meetings, we have people sh uh, share how they're doing today and you know what they need to get off their chest to be able to show up and work and do the work. And so by giving people a space to, to share what's going on in their life, why they care about an issue, who they are and why this matters to them. It lets them be able to open up, be more vulnerable and uh, be able to fully show up and engage deeply in the work. Wow, that sounds like human first. We talked about people first, uh, Stan, a few minutes ago. That human side being first, engaging people uh, in that way. And, and as mentioned earlier by a couple of you, sort of the work uh, comes out of that, engaging people, impacting them, getting them excited and inspired to do the work. 
what's the everyday look like? And I know the word discipline was used as well by Montana, but Stan, what do you, what's that everyday look like? I, I'm, I'm probably not the best person to answer that because I am have been more working with the organizations, various organizations to make the shift. Um, but to tie in, you know, I, I, I want to start thinking about, I want to do comparisons. What is a uh, conventional worldview and what is an engagement organizing worldview so that you start seeing the difference um, and you're able to say, oh, how, how we go, what, what a day-to-day -day thing looks like. Um, and that helps also to um, set direction where you're going. Um, you know, one of the things is I would, let's compare organizations that are raising money to do the work and then organizations that are raising money as part of a broader uh, engagement strategy of bringing people in and so on a day that the first organization and that's many of them they say well we need more money to hire more staff to do the job whereas an engagement organizing uh, it would well we need to bring more people in to not only bring their money their creativity their time their talent their leadership their connections uh, that much broader array um, and so uh, you know the the staff who you'd be hiring in in the the the, the donation driven worldview is different than the staff you're hiring in the engagement worldview. So those are mm, beautiful. Some well, that's a great example. I really um, I really value that example for sure. And I can't help but think you know I think about an executive director and I think you know one of the big roles of an executive director is to look at that strategic plan. How does a strategic plan and engagement organizing go together, Graham? Well, I think it really boils down to the question, what kind of organization do you want to be, right? And the mm -hmm. strategic plan is the place at which um, the board's vision and its responsibility for the broader strategic directions of the organization and the staff's leadership on a day-to-day -day basis come together in consultation with the external environment and strategic opportunities to kind of set the overall tone for an organization. Um, and it does need to be a deliberate decision, right? It's, it's no less a deliberate decision than wanting to be a, a leading scientific authority on an issue. It's no less a deliberate decision than wanting to be the best lobbyists or researchers on an issue. Uh, if you want to engage people well, you do have to make the decision that that is something that you are going to commit yourself to and prioritize. And it's also, it's not the easiest part of the work. I actually think one reason why um, the NGO community often doesn't mobilize people better is just because it's hard. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's actually very easy to have an opinion right? And we spend all of our lives essentially having conversations with other people whose opinions we already kind of know, right? They, we, might, we might like their opinion, so we get together, we talk about strategy with them, or we might dislike their opinion, so we lobby them. But most of our conversations within the NGO community are often with people whose opinions we already know. And, and making a deliberate effort to, to be an engagement organization, to be an engagement organizing organization is about making a decision, a, a deliberate effort to get outside your comfort zone and engage people who you don't already know to bring them in. And when you do so, what you find is you are surrounded by people who in one way or another are raising their hand and saying, I'm interested in your mission. Mm -hmm. Maybe they come to a meeting. Maybe they like your Facebook post. Maybe they take an email action. Maybe they come out. And, and, and then the next question is, if you are in fact surrounded by all those people who are raising their hand and saying, I'm interested, you have to make a deliberate effort to treat that relationship with respect. And someone comes out to your meeting and you don't take the time to get their name or follow up, missed opportunity. Mm -hmm. Someone follows you on Facebook and you don't have a strategy for engaging people and moving them into other levels like, like email action, missed opportunity. 
And you have to treat that as a, as a meaningful relationship that you are trying to cultivate and steward. And that isn't easy. It requires a strategic plan that deliberately sets out and prioritizes those kinds of relationships. And Graham, I can't help but, and sorry, my camera has, uh, has gone out. It's, uh, it's having a bad Monday. Um, but what's, you know, when I think about all the things that you've just talked about in terms of, you know, working that in, making it deliberate, I can't help but sort of think about it from the perspective of, of a board. How, Montana, do you ensure that the board is on side? And, and does, that, does that take work as well? Yeah, well, like Graham said, it is a really high touch way of doing things. And the folks that are best at it are the folks that are committed to that and are trying to skip over steps and really going methodically and, and slowly, frankly. So I think your board, they need to be the same kind of folks that are committed to relationship building and you need to have strong relationships with your board. So when I, um, when I was interviewing for my job, I laid out what I wanted to do with the organization, which was basically reconfigure it to be completely focused on engagement organizing as its primary strategy. Other strategies as well to complement it, but I thought that was our opportunity in the time and the place we were in. And so I was like, if you don't wanna do that, don't hire me. And if you do wanna do that, then hire me and I will do it and I'll do it as well as I can. So um, I was very explicit about wanting to go in that direction and having that be my entire ethos for professionally and personally what I was willing to bring. So with that, they, you know, they said, yes, that's what they wanted to do. And as board members have come and go over the time I've been here, um, it's been very clearly explained and very clearly outlined in our strategic plan that this is our theory of change, that we do engagement organizing and there's other strategies we do that are complementary, but this is our, our, what we're great at in our region at this time. Mm -hmm. I know all three of you are inspiring uh, people today, Stan, when you think about resources aside from our time together today, can you point to any resources where somebody might, might go to, to learn more about engagement organizing and, and, you know, more about how to make it work and see if it's right for their organization. Yeah, okay, you know, that, that there's a critical issue here of uh, gaining an understanding as to the what the worldview is. And we've dealt with uh, numbers of groups. Um, and if, if, you, if, you, if you grasp it and you wanna go on that journey, great. Uh, but oftentimes it, it um, you know, that theory of change is, is too far away but um you know across the country there have been various things that have gone on over the years uh in we'll hear later on from the sustainability network who's does workshops and has a whole bunch of resources on their website um there's a number of groups on the west coast uh, nature canada has a little guide to uh engagement organizing on their website that you can download um, I, I am on the mailing list of the Stanford uh, social resource list and the great articles coming out all the time. Matt Price's book on engagement organizing. Um, those are just some, a few. And, and then, you know, it's finding people who are, uh, oh, some organizations like, uh, well, follow what Montana's doing. Get, get stuff from, get their email, Dogwood, get on their email list. And you just start saying, hey, what are they doing? Um, why are they doing that? What's, mm -hmm. and, and then there are little training opportunities that come with it. And one, one method is forming small communities of practice, find other people who are wanting to be on that learning journey and, um, and carry on with them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all the different, sizes of organizations that would take this on. I know, Graham, you have a very big organization, some smaller organizations. What advice would you have from, from that perspective, from a larger organization taking this on, maybe over a period of time? And maybe we can uh, ask uh, Montana a little bit about the size of her organization as well. 
I guess I'd say two things. First of all, as I said earlier, you have to commit the resources to it, right? So the largest team in Nature Canada is now our Nature Network team that are that are a group of organizers that are focused on working with grassroots nature organizations. And the communications team has expanded significantly so that we can better manage our digital relationships. And so you really do, from a staffing perspective, um, both of those teams are bigger than our policy team. And that's a conscious decision that's being made within the organization. But the other thing from the perspective of larger organizations is you have an opportunity to develop strategic relationships with smaller organizations in ways that are mutually beneficial. So like Montana, you know, I would not have taken this job that I'm in as executive director of Nature Canada if the board had not explicitly said to me that they were interested in investing in strengthening the nature community as a whole. Because what is the nature community when you think about it, right? You go into no matter what size of town you go into, no matter almost no matter how small across Canada, you find the birders and the botanists and the canoe associations and trail associations. You find the, the wildlife centers and the land trusts and the local nature groups. There's this incredible diversity, um, an ecosystem of local nature organizations that is deeply woven into the fabric of Canadian society, but quite frankly, is often painfully bad at systematically keeping track and engaging a supporter base and is often quite good. Um, and so Nature Canada has, has really said, we succeed in our mission when that ecosystem of nature organizations gets stronger and is better able to engage more organizations. So no matter how large or small as an organization you are, the fundamental question about how can we be developing solidarity and strategic alliances to grow a movement is a fundamental question. Interesting. And I want to ask Montana the question, as I mentioned, about maybe a smaller organization and, and some of the challenges or the successes there. And I also want to ask the tools that you use. Are you using some sort of CRM or you to try and manage all this. I'm just picturing all these balls in the air. How do you keep it all together? So when I started um, in 2016, there was um, me and the equivalent of one other staff person. So two full-time staff people. Um, and over the last six and a half years, we've grown to 18. So I'm very proud of that. <laughs> it's still like small beans compared to a lot of the groups, but yeah, it's, we've grown because we've had the need to grow our staff capacity to get the work done. We also have a much larger volunteer network than we did and a much larger supporter base than we did. So we've grown through all of the, um, the different uh, human resources that are, are out there. And one of the reasons we we were able to grow was because we were able to be nimble and, and think about um, the work that needed to be done and be very uh, nimble in the way we did it. So, you know, we'd hire people to do one thing and then they'd do one thing and another thing all within, you know, still the hours that they were um, able to do. But we really tried to um, get the work done however we could resource it to be able to do engagement organizing across all of our programs. And I think from that, we've seen um, the leadership of the folks, and they're often young folks that come into engagement organizing work. We've seen the leadership in our community and our region really uh, take off. And there's been a whole bunch of other spin-off organizations that have come about um, based from folks that were either on staff or key volunteers. And that's great. Like everyone has their niche there's lots of work to do we don't need to like hoard it as one organization and we're very you know happy about that um and then we've tried to just be really specific about what is the thing we're trying to do um, what are the programs that we can run that are really great and um we can do those as nature or sorry not nature canada <laughs> neighbors united um and I, I will just add that our kind of flagship program um which is our deep canvassing program is really taking engagement organizing and ramping it up to like an 11 on the relationship scale um that was a spinal tap reference for those of you who may <laughs> I think that was for you. Um, and so it's uh, deep canvassing is about uh, meeting people where they're at, as Graham was talking about. We're often not great at doing that, and helping people resolve their cognitive dissonance 
those people that aren't like, you know, probably most of us on the call that are busy, not that we're not all busy, um, you know, trying to get their kids to school and aren't thinking about the environment or climate change or biodiversity as kind of a core thing that's going on in their lives. So we're helping them relate to it through a specific kind of conversation methodology and helping them resolve their cognitive dissonance to realize they actually do agree with the policy things we need to have happen at the local government, provincial or national scale. And we're doing that one conversation at a time through a team of folks, staff and volunteers, and we're doing it in places that are traditionally left out of the conversation. So rural, uh, suburban, small town, basically non-progressive centers in, um, in Canada so far. So um, to do that work well, you have to use engagement organizing and you have to put relationships first to create that culture for people to keep being able to come back and have those conversations to build the skills and leadership of the people having those conversations, be they staff or volunteers, and to get the results of being able to have enough persuasive, persuasive conversations with people to make a difference. Mm -hmm, for sure. And I just want to touch before, if we want to hear from everybody on the call today. Uh, we welcome you to put any questions in the Q&A. We're happy to take any of those questions. I've uh, been blessed to be able to answer, to ask a lot of questions, but certainly we want your questions as well. But just before we walk off, I just wanted to just go back to the question about tools. Are, are there tools or that you're using? And, and I feel free for anyone to answer this question. Yeah, so I, I would say, and as some of you know, I'm seeing Velta Thompson's um, name in that list, who I did a lot of door knocking with at, along with uh, Rob Barnes at Ecology Ottawa. At a certain level, your most important tool is a, um, what's it called? The, not flip, the, the, what's it called? The binder? I said database, but. but no, no. Clipboard. Clipboard. There clipboard. you see. <laughs> at a certain level, your most important tool is a clipboard. Because um, at the end of the day, meeting people where they're at is often means going into spaces and, and being willing to make sure that everybody you talk to, you try to get their name, everyone who shows up at the event, you try to get their name. So this is not all a kind of a, a fancy way of operationalizing new algorithms on social media. It is very <laughs> much old school, right? Like it's not, if someone takes the time to come to your event, and you don't ask them for their name and contact information so that you can invite them to the next event, then that is not developing a respectful relationship with your supporters. And if you are the kind of organization that can actually go to doors and talk to people and do that kind of organizing, then you're going to grow tremendously. The Ecology Ottawa went from nothing to 40, 50,000 people on its list. And I guarantee you 25, 30,000 of them came from the clipboard, not from the digital signups. But then we are also entering a new era, right? Like it, it, there are a variety of off the shelf um, digital online organizing systems that go a very long way in terms of helping you keep track of your supporters. Um, and you can, you can get tools like Nation Builder, um, which are not extremely expensive for the organization, but which will allow you to consolidate your supporters in one place. And sometimes, yes, that does involve a lot of data entry from the clipboard. Um, but at the end of the day, you can now begin to manage your supporters at scale using relatively inexpensive online organizing system, systems and communicate with people at a level that, that, you, that we never had before. And then at the same time, it is impossible to ignore the fact that a very high percentage of people are now getting their information from social media. Mm -hmm. And there are ways to strategically engage with that space where you're talking to a lot of people at one time. Mm -hmm, for sure, great information there, Graham encouraging uh, everybody as well to to put their questions in the q and a if you've got a question I know we're we're coming up on time we've got a few other things to to tackle today but before we go any farther uh, Stan or Montana anything to add to the to the tool yeah. uh, kit if you will Montana I, I, I'm well I, I'm gonna dump it and say it's it's okay. more fundamental I think the theory of change tool, that that looking at your mission and your vision and your how you're bringing it about is the fundamental place that you, once you have to get that straight it, and once you're starting about you know saying okay we're going to develop our people power 
then you can build on from there. So way before the, the, the databases, the digital and all the rest, it's, it's setting up the, 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 the culture of an organizing and the scaling up stuff has to be, people want to go to the CRMs and the databases, but no, no, no. Why? What are you doing with that? So I think those, the pyramids, your engagement pathways, put it, it's like, it's like putting out bait. We're fishing for interested people in all different ways. And then once we get them, where, where do we go with them? What do we learn about them? How do we work together? And then the digital stuff comes in. So, okay. Montana, anything from you? Yeah, when you, I, I realized my last answer, I avoided the CRM, not on purpose, but because it's so awful. <laughs> CRMs are <laughs> such a pain. There's no perfect CRM, folks. So stop looking for the perfect one. As far as I know, it doesn't exist within a budget like I have and probably most of you have. Um, when, we, when we think of engagement organizing, we think of people taking actions in all the ways, including donating. So it's like a web of engagement. Sometimes they move up, sometimes they move down, sometimes they move lottery, they give their time, they give their money. And if you're trying to find in CRM that does all those things super well, it doesn't exist. For a small budget. So um, we use something called Civi CRM. It's open source. It's super unuser friendly. We've been trying to change for years and we've had our staff explore, various staff explore various different databases. Well, and on CRM. Oh yeah. And um, in, in Canada, it's particularly challenging. In the US, they have some more advanced things, but they're not available yet. In Canada, if you want to use Canadian currency for a reasonable cost. So yeah. So Honestly, we're still at the point where we download a lot of data in Excel and we manipulate it that way. And then we upload it again to CVCRM and it's super user intensive and painful. But like Stan said, at the end of the day, it comes down to having relationships, being able to track them. So do what you can with the resources you have and, and talk to your friends at other groups to hear the pros and cons of what they're using. Um, but I think one of the most important tools in engagement organizing and that should be the environmental movement is is storytelling and being able to tell a good story that is emotional and compelling that has elements of uh, being able to open people up and really be clear what's at stake for you and why and then being able to be really curious and ask curious questions so you can understand why someone else may be interested in getting involved and what's at stake for them. When have they experienced climate change or biodiversity loss in their personal lives? Like what is really at stake? So if we can, uh, and there's lots of tools, or sorry, lots of like templates, lots of resources out there on, um, on how to do good storytelling and how to draw out other folks' stories. Um, so I think if we can get that base skill down as a movement, then we can build those relationships and develop strategies and take actions and get to the point where we need to track a lot of data. Amazing. Excellent. Excellent conversation there. Love the storytelling piece, of course, from my perspective. Love that very much. We've got a great question from Kathy. Uh, Kathy writes, our audience is teachers, engaging them to use resources to empower students to learn and take action. How would engagement organizing work for this audience. Who wants to take this one? I, I, I'll love, love, great to take that. And Kathy, I think uh, that's been a problem in the environmental ed sector. We've only worked at teachers. Really, our audience is anyone who wants to bring about change. So it's students, it's parents, uh, it's other members of the community. Um, and so what's the fundamental change that we're trying to do? Is just use those resources? No, we want to change uh, the, the ed, how education is practiced. And so um, how do we broaden that base of players? Because teachers, they're only one small slice of the pie. It's much broader. And so I would say that, you know, we should be looking at our theory of change for environmental ed. Um, and how do we change the education system as opposed to just what lessons are used uh, next week by a particular teacher in a classroom. Mm -hmm. So could I add to that? Of course. Um, so Kathy, I mean, it's you, you probably know the answer to this question better than I do because of the work you're doing at Green Learning Foundation. Um, but Nature Canada does have a program called Naturehood, which is about getting kids and, uh, and families into nearby nature. I've just put a link to a, a web page we developed uh, called Nature Homeschool which is essentially an attempt to amalgamate 
or bring together various different kinds of uh, nature learning resources for teachers. Um, would love to talk to you more about about that. I mean, I think I think we have tried in some of our paid promotion advertising to use um, social media algorithms to target teachers and um, our communication staff who have done some work promoting Nature Homeschool might be um, might be open to having that conversation and think about uh, collaboration or exchange of information. Um, but at the end of the day, there's no substitute to just thinking about the nodes, right? Like, where do people come together? And I think this is relevant to engagement organizing more generally. And there, there are within any kind of community people that are already at the centers of sub-communities. Um, and often it's much easier to uh, just work strategically through those people than to try to develop your own direct uh, audience. I'm assuming things like obviously um, school boards and things like that would be um, would be an example of a node in the in the education system. But once again, you would know better than I would. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much. Oh, Montana, did you want to add something? Just one little thing. I think regardless of the audience you're trying to engage, the first step is having conversations with the people that are, are raising their hand, as Graham said, and showing up. So be it one teacher or five teachers, some that you think might be interested or you know are interested, having that one-on-one -on -one conversation, hearing their story, why they care, sharing your story, why you care, trying to figure out what their goals are, sharing what supports you might have, what your goals are, and, and building that relationship. And if you can do that with enough folks, then you can start to you know power map it and see where there's um, points of convergence or points of divergence. What are your common goals? How can you work together? So any, any starting point is a whole bunch of conversations that take a long time to have if it's enough folks. For sure. Thanks so much for all of you uh, uh, dipping into that question and, and providing some response. I want to turn it over now uh, to Paul Bubulis. Bob, or Paul, are you there? Yes. Hi, Hi everyone. You. From the Sustainability Network. Uh, Paul, take it away. So I was going to take uh, three or four minutes just to kind of go through um, our our fundamentals, our uh, programs, and uh, and then most of all our, our kind of upcoming offerings. I don't want I'm I'm trying to to I'll race through the uh, the drier stuff, and and hopefully focus on the more interesting what's coming up. So um, yeah, we are a Toronto-based national Ango capacity builder. We I mean our our mission is to help Ango's lead, manage, and strategize. Our theory of change is that if you help those organizations manage and attract dollars, manage people and embrace people power and communicate, uh, all that is capacity towards them achieving their policy objectives. So we, we, don't, we don't actually work on environmental issues, but everything that an uh, ENGO needs to be successful is what we focus on. So right now, uh, three key programs, one called Vision 2030, which is looking 10 years out and looking at five key sector priorities with, with leaders from across the country. That's just kind of getting underway. Um, a program around supporting Indigenous conservation, so IPCA. It's got a, a session on um, the knowledge basket that's put out by the tr um, uh, Conservation Through Reconciliation Partnership. And, and in a program that um, uh, was, was, was mentioned and is the focus of today's session. So engagement organized for seven years through Stan and Gosling Foundation and a lot of the people on the call and all the people on the call today, um, there's various resources as you know, the chat room has that link, um, webinars, Matt Price's uh, papers, uh, studies, et cetera, et cetera. So engagement organizing is also kind of a key program for us. Um, but coming up, but specifically on engagement organizing, um, a lot coming up this fall. So we're going to have a, a, a six-part session with Renata Woodward, who's ex of uh, Nature Trust of New Brunswick, on engagement organizing 101. So just a, a, an introduction into uh, what's uh, the topic of discussion today. Uh, following that, in October and into November, we'll have a six-part session with Mike Balkwell and Water Watchers, who are you know, key exponents, I think, of, of this approach. 
And so that session uh, loosely entitled uh, Campaigning for ENGOs, the world according to Mike Bockwell and Water Watchers. Um, but other things we have coming up, we have a, 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 a nine part series on, on leadership. So Michael Bornstein is a master trainer with gift planners and a, a, a prophet Ryerson and George Brown. We'll be doing five sessions on various aspects of leadership. And these will be like lecture Q and A's followed by a four part skills workshop camera on more, uh, more intimate sort of, um, uh, workshopping of, of a lot of that, that material. Um, as well as stuff coming up on um, Mark Bloomberg on Charity Law, uh, Andrew Musselman on winning your virtual audience, Sean Moore on advocacy school and uh, government relations, and, uh, and much, much more. So yeah, you can check us out, sustainabilitynetwork.ca. Either sign up for our weekly, bi-weekly event blast, sign up for our free monthly digest, or um, uh, start to register some of those events aren't but they will be up there in the in the coming days but uh for sure the session we do in a couple of weeks on knowledge basket is there to register for and finally uh, my pleasure to invite you all who are in the toronto area to come out on september 15th the harbor front uh for our 25th anniversary celebration so i know graham is going to be there i hope stan's going to be there we'll be there maybe hannah who knows but uh yeah come on out and that's also at sustainabilitynetwork.ca. So uh, thanks for the opportunity to kind of share what we do. And um, back to Sam. Well, thank you so much, Paul. That was great. And once again, always learned something from all of you today. And when I think about, you know, how to sort of move forward, I know you've inspired some people today. In your opinion, Montana, is, is this right for everybody? Is uh, you know, is engagement organizing right for every organization or does it take, you know, a special type of organization for this to work? Well, <laughs> my answer is yes, it's right for everybody, but I think others would probably disagree only because I don't think you have to do it on like a giant scale. I think it's based in having um, relationships, meaningful relationships, like Graham keeps saying that are based in respect and whether it's with 10 people or two people or 100,000 people, I think you're still applying the same principles. It's just a different scale. So I think even if you're doing um, different kinds of strategies, um, what's, what's, why wouldn't you do engagement organizing? Why wouldn't you prioritize building relationships? Why wouldn't you prioritize having them based in stories and mutual accountability? It doesn't mean you have to run giant mobilizations, but like I said, I use it with all of my internal staff and the way our staff is structured, even though they're paid staff. So I think the principles everyone should be using because they're just kind of like common, respectful relationships to build leadership and then build power. Um, but in terms of running full on big mobilizations, no, I don't think every organization needs to do that. I think we need to work together and networks are a great place to do that, like sustainability network, climate action network, organizing for change. So you can understand what are the different niches people are working in and use your complementary skills and strategies to have that big effect. Graham or San, anything to add to uh, Montana's thoughts there? Yeah, you know, we're, we're building civil society. We're, we're supporting democratic practice. And, and, and to get better at that, uh, it will strengthen us as a society with the ch challenges that we have now. So uh, the other options on how to address these aren't so good. They've taken us to some dark places. So I don't really see any other way of, of you know, and I think it's fundamental. How do we get people involved in action and decision making in, in these times of crises? Yeah, I mean, I guess I would say two things on this. On the first, on, on the on the first level, I think there's often something fundamentally wrong with the way we think about change, um, in the sense that we've kind of adopted this Enlightenment era notion of saying, because we're right, then all we have to do is say so to decision makers, and well, they'll understand that we're right, and so they'll adopt policies that respond to our needs, 
So all we really have to do is just be smart and explain how smart we are to decision makers. <laughs> um, and that's a really, to be honest, a naive understanding of how decisions get made in society. It's really one that ignores the relationships between vested interests and how those vested interests use their power to influence outcomes. And I really do think we have to get past this kind of enlightenment era notion that just because we're right, then that just means we just have to say, sit, tell people that and that's, and that's it because we're doing our job there. On the other hand, I, I would like, I don't disagree with anything Montana said, but my point is not that we all have to do the same thing. Right. My point is not that if you're a scientist or a researcher or a lobbyist or whatever, that, that that's not a valuable role to be playing in a movement. And I know Montana was definitely not suggesting that it's not a valuable role. Um, but I don't think we do all need to do it. The way I see it is more like if you are an organization and you probably are. That, it, that is engaging a supporter base, then why would you not do it? How could you not have a strategy for successful organizing and engagement with that supporter base? And also like if you're, the other way I look at it is it's sort of like a toolbox. And I know this is a le little bit cliche, but it's true. Like a movement is like a toolbox. It takes all kinds. We need the lawyers and the lobbyists, the researchers, the scientists, the progressive politicians. You know, we need all those people, but we also need a public mobilization. We need people power. And if you show up at a construction site and you haven't brought a hammer or a screwdriver or a wrench, you're not really prepared to build. And a lot of the time, that's how we behave as a movement. We show up around an issue and we don't have a hammer, we don't have a screwdriver, we don't have a wrench, and then we wonder why no one's listening to us. And so it really is, engagement organizing is like three essential tools in the toolbox. And if we as a movement don't have it, then we're really not thinking strategically and seriously about how change happens in society. Really interesting. And that uh, is the perfect way to, to end our time together today. A big thank you, Stan, Montana, and Graham. I think we could go another hour easily, easily go another hour. <laughs> our time together um, ends now, but certainly the Capacity Building Institute, uh, you know, has just got so many excellent uh, webinars coming up. So definitely check out uh, what they're doing. And a big thanks as well, of course, to Paul. Thank you so much. Uh, from the Sustainability Network for uh, your uh, contribution today. And uh, Rob Barnes, thanks for the invitation today to host uh, today. And I learned lots today uh, that I'm certainly going to take back into my work as well. So thank you so much, Mr. Barnes. And thank you to the Capacity Building Institute for all of your great work and for this opportunity to chat with so many fabulous people. Absolutely. Beautifully said. Thanks so much, everybody. We will see you in September. Stay safe, everyone. <laughs>